kingdom polemics exist to equip the church for battle against the kingdom of darkness in light of the particular threats of our day. Kingdom polemics is about taking the cosmic Christological concepts of the Scottish Reformed and connecting it to the ground. Good afternoon, or good whatever the time it is when you hear this. I've been busy. I've been busy uh, because there's been some things on my mind that uh, I felt like I needed to process publicly with you. Uh, But also, there's been some requests a few requests and uh, had a listener say, hey, I really would like you to discuss where you would coincide or, or differ from Al Mohler's uh, discussion on Christian nationalism. And so I mean, let me listen to it and I'll see. So I, I listened to it and I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. Uh, I think it's worthy of a interaction and i at this point i've recorded and they should be out before this recorded an interaction uh with two christ and culture conversations one on presbycast with scott clark and some other person another one with uh kevin de young and trunin and what i find interesting is that i have more in common with the Christ and culture conversation with the Southern Baptists than uh, the fellow Presbyterians. Uh, this this uh, podcast, I find myself in most most of it. I am I am green <laughs> with the with the Southern Baptists. Uh, I guess you can make that up. What uh, make of that up? What you will. But yeah, I have some differences. So let's go. Let's let's get in it and um, see how we uh, have uh, continuity with our thoughts and also where we have contrast. Say, so, you know, in one sense, this is a very clever packaging just to try to scare people by putting together the words Christian and nationalism as if that's some threat to uh our constitutional form of government, which is, I think, exactly contrary to the truth. I think it's it's the foundational worldview that makes our constitutional system of government, indeed, our entire civilizational system, possible. So that's what's new. He's he's addressing about how people are using the Christian nationalism thing basically to describe us as some kind of domestic terrorists that are a threat uh, to the constitutional civil stability of this nation. And Moeller says, well, actually, our the Christian worldview is what holds this whole constitutional civil uh, system together. And here's where I have a, a contrast and some continuity. I, I think that on the one hand, you can say that the Christian worldview and, you know, the, the Protestant confessional worldview, it is that which is used in some ways to form uh, this nation and to uh, order and uh, order and organize the the civil sphere, right? Separation of powers, uh, the consent of the governed, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff. Yeah, you can say that that's uh, the was grounded and supported by by the Christian worldview, but. Our worldview is both what grounds, I think, America's constitution, but also threatens it. Uh, See, Psalms 2 can ground uh, a a nation's uh, political philosophy in some ways, but it also is a threat to it. Whenever that nation uh, that borrows from the scriptures, that, that builds from the scriptures in any way, when that nation seeks to undermine something about the lordship of Christ, uh, either originally or ongoingly, like it is a threat. So Christianity is always a threat. In the Old Testament, uh, the prophets and the truth of God's word was always a threat uh, to the civil order, not just the civil order, to the, to the ecclesiological order. Right? 
Um, and by the way, part of the reason why I would say that the Christian worldview is both that which grounds our civil order, but also is a threat to it, is if you look at our Constitution, there's literally no conversation about the lordship of Jesus Christ. So while you'll have, and, and this is where you know Christians will say, well, we don't we don't need that there. Well, if if Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth, if he is the one who all things are under his feet, right? If if he is a ruler of the kings of the earth, as Revelation 1 says, if he is the one, if the if government is a deacon that reports to him, uh, it's it's hard to make a case for a document that doesn't acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as a sovereign would not have some issues with the Lord himself. Right. So I I would say that that Christianity or the, or, or or Christ is both that which holds a lot of our founding and documents together, but also would be a threat to it at the same time, particularly now with the way things are. What's new is lot of societies and nations, culture. I'm at Southern Seminary. Those are not the... can't understand uh, what we call Europe, and you can't understand America without the influence of Christianity and the gospel. We do have to distinguish, obviously, the Francis Schaeffer used to do this, speak about the primary effects of the gospel, which is bringing salvation to God's people, bringing them into the church, and then also the secondary tertiary benefits. And, and you certainly see the impact of a larger Christian worldview on the West, on America, uh, the establishment even of our government, the separate. This is a great point that I would wholeheartedly agree with, that the gospel the gospel of Christ has primary, secondary, and tertiary effects. So, so you could say, you know, primary, right? Forgiveness of sins, justification, union with Christ, eternal life. And then maybe you say secondary, like, you know, sanctification and uh, the, the ethical life, right? Your, your, your declarative benefits and your transformational or you could, they, they, they could be very close, those first and second. But the tertiary, I believe that it is something that many evangelicals in non-reformed or reform will reject. There is a tertiary consequence to the gospel. And so some people see the first and second tier benefits of the gospel as the monopoly. There is no tertiary, right? So. The economy is not affected by gospel believing people. You know, the uh, the way that uh, laws are made and the way that people do science, the way that people. Uh, let's put it this way, the way that people do law, whatever. Those things are not effects of the gospel. There's these people that would say the effects of the gospel is justification, sanctification, you know, eternal life, et cetera, et cetera. And they're wrong. They're wrong. Uh, the scriptures regularly, the Reformed tradition regularly, and just experience confirms that there is a breadcrumb, a set of consequences that, that leads to things like money and science and infrastructure and art being affected by regenerate people. Even just something as simple as gunpowder, right? So... Chinese discover gunpowder. What do they do with gunpowder with their worldview? They just blow things up and make fireworks. That's what they do. Well, in the West, with the Christian worldview, they discover gunpowder. What do they do with gunpowder? They use it to build things for the common good, not just make explosions to entertain people. Well, science, which believes that this universe is governed by uh, a sovereign, right, that that governs all things predictably according to his character with regularity, uh, it, it affects. So, so, so gospel-renewed people uh, see the world they live in in light of those things, and there, it, there will be an effect. So even just like well, slavery being a, 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 an uninterrupted reality, 
an, a, 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 an institutional commonality for, for since the beginning of time, it gets affected by, you know, people like John Newton and people in their churches getting converted by, by the gospel. Um, so that this is a very good observation, something that I believe is underemphasized uh, by the means of grace types of people, which I am one of those. Um, but I understand that those means, um, they affect everything about your life and everything around you. And also, I, I would say that there's some people that take the tertiary effects of the gospel and they say this is the gospel. <laughs> Hey, these are the these are the, the social justice transformationalists, you know, the revolutionary views of the gospel. So they 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 monopolize the tertiary effects and kind of absorb the primary. The the pietists will will see the primary and secondary and 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 just see it exclusively as that. But but this these men very wisely show that there is a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary conversation about the gospel and its effects. Uh, and if you deny that, you're either just really, 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 really oblivious to reality, uh, really oblivious to, to history, church history, American history, or, or you're, you're just so committed to your theological narrowness that you're just digging your heels in just to make a point, even though it's just, it's just, it's just absurd. Of powers, the danger, you know, the concern they had to not put too much power in too few. And if you look at polarized story here, as you know, we're talking about the English speaking enlightenment that, that shaped claims and rescuing the transformation of them. All, all I want to say is either having to be a little more in the 1950s. Yeah, that's one of the things this month, uh, Dr. John Wilsey historian there at Southern, has written on the different forms, second table of the law, but not the first table. About the Enlightenment project and the way they wanted to keep a Christian morality, but to deny it from kind of a Christian theology. And that seems to be similar to the way in which some have said that we can try to impose or to make use of the second table of the law, but not the first table of the law. I'm just wondering how you understand those two things. So, Steve, you had already mentioned that a little bit. Is there a place today? And so maybe this is a historical question, or maybe it's one of just political theory in some of these newer questions. Should the first and the second table of the law be a source of enforcement today, or are we only going with the second? And if only the second, does history show us that the denial of the first table and the worship of God actually makes it impossible to maintain the second? Dr. Muller, what do you think? I think that we need a language structure to try to figure out how we're going to talk about this. So the way I put it is this. I don't believe that Western civilization can endure without acknowledging the first table of the law and obeying the second table. And so I'm, I'm a Baptist. I'm a conversionist. So I can't say that the civilization is to be predicated upon confessional faith as is reflected in the first table of the law. I can say that our society won't survive without the historical acknowledgement of it. And this is the one part where Mulder just falls apart, uh, I believe. And this is the this is what this is where the Baptists uh that are into some concept of Christian nation really fall apart. So first he, he says, look, the first table must be acknowledged and the second obeyed. And he starts talking about conversion. Uh, and he says, yeah, you can't, you can acknowledge the first table law, but you can, in a, a society can acknowledge the first table law, but can only obey the second table of law. And I'm a conversionist. Let me just say, first of all, that you can't obey any of the Ten Commandments in a doxological sense, um, unless you're converted. So the, the idea like, oh, conversion is societally pertinent to first table, but second table, you can impose obedience on society no you can't obey any of the commandments of the 10 of them apart from conversion so saying i'm a conversionist and then hacking up first and second table law uh, isn't saying anything of substance i believe the the, the first to 10 commandments are obeyed doxologically by conversion however the first to 10th commandments by the way Mulder will contradict himself later the first and tenth commandments, however, can be externally, externally uh, acknowledged and subjected to without conversion, without obedience. Okay, 
So you can you can externally conform to the adult the the adultery prohibition um, in rebellion against God, right? You can keep the Sabbath. You can you know in the Old Testament Israel the the, the foreigners that were not believers, hey, you're not going to open your business Sabbath even though you're not Sabbathing in Christ. You cannot you know make images, false images of Christ or any images of Christ or images of other gods, and externally abide by that publicly, right? Though you don't convergentalistically abide by that. So uh, you don't have to be a confessional converted Christian to be subject to the Decalogue. The Decalogue in the civil sense restrains externally. But the Decalogue in the covenant of grace sense has a doxological internal uh, oversight. So the, let me just say, say this. So we can't have a confessional state about the first table of the law. Okay, so what is the first table of law if the state has no confessional st standard for what that is? So he's saying that, well, the, the state must acknowledge the first table, but the state can only enforce obedience to the second table. I just ad addressed that. So what about the first table is a state to acknowledge? Which God is the one to be blasphemed and and who how do you how do you blaspheme her, him or not? What is the second commandment? What does it mean to take the Lord's name in vain and what is the Sabbath? You cannot acknowledge the first table or the, by the way the confessions they don't just qualify the first table but they also qualify us you can acknowledge that without having some confessional state. What I mean by that, a state that abides by uh, a standard. A standard which qualifies what that first table is and what it's not. And what the second, second table is, what it's not, right? Um, yeah, and, and just to say that If conversion is that which makes the Ten Commandments valid, uh, is if, if that's the principle, then we're going to have a problem. Uh, because the unconverted, um, they, they don't see marriage the way we do. They don't see property the way we do. They don't see family the way we do. They don't see worship the... They don't, so we can't say, well, you know, you're unconverted and you're not converted. So therefore, the Ten Commandments, in an external public sense, you know, in, in half of the first, in, in half of the table of the law, uh, in the first table of law, is, is off limits. No, that will be absolute anarchy, right? You don't have to be converted to be subject to uh, these things, okay? And that's a that's a position the left now would say is just you know oppressive privilege, but you know that happens to be not only true. I say as a Christian, it's also true. I say as an historian, you know, in, in terms of American history. So I, I want to be careful. I think where the integralists and 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 some forms of Christian nationalists, theonomists, make a huge mistake is that I want to require citizens to acknowledge the first table of the law, but you know, in order to call them believers. I'm going to have to uh, abandon my theology, which I can't do because of my understanding of the gospel. All believers can and do with any of the Ten Commandments is acknowledge them and externally comply. But simply because you can't violate the Sabbath in your business, simply because you can't desecrate the Lord Jesus' name in public, simply because you can't uh, set up monuments of idolatry against the second command simply because you cannot do things. Con doesn't mean I'm, I'm you're converted. You're not converted, but guess what? You're not going to be able to enshrine things that violate the first table of law in public life. You don't have to believe this. You don't have to love this. You don't have to be converted, but you're not going to do it. <laughs> you're not going to do it. You're, you're not going to have New York City have a Muslim call of prayer. You don't have to be praying. You don't have to go to church on Sunday and pray the Lord's Prayer with the church. But you're not, you're not imposing 
lies, blasphemy, uh, idolatry uh, on public life. So whether people are converted or not, the Ten Commandments are clearly the creational universal standard. The, the, and by the way, the Ten Commandments are Christian. And the Christian Ten Commandments are written on the law of every image bearer or whether they're not Christian, right? And so I'm a conversionist. And so I, you know, and, and I'm also, uh, uh, you know, a Baptist. So I can't baptize babies and now say they are now, you know, effectively participants in the church in the sense of the first table of the law. So I hope that makes sense. I, I, those are. Yeah, I, I'm a Presbyterian and uh, I'm also a conversionist. I believe that our baptized babies need to be converted and indwelt by the Spirit of God. But guess what? I am a Christian who has the Spirit of God. Which means that there is a commonwealth in my house that governs everybody in that house, whether or not everyone there is internally participating in the indwelling spirit of God and the reality and substance of the covenant of grace. I, however, am converted and I have a sphere of oversight. And here's the thing about someone like, oh, we can't impose the first table of law on, on a society because everyone's not regenerate. They can acknowledge it, whatever that means. Uh, um, well, guess what? The reason why the states had first table laws in, uh, in, in public life was because there was regenerate people that had the spirit of God that were converted that said, I now have a commonwealth. I have a sphere that I'm over and I am regenerate. And so far as I am a representational, authoritative figure, and the confessions make it make it very clear, why is the commandment, the fourth commandment, directed at superiors? Well, because superiors oversee many groups of people. And when if you have the spirit of God, if you are converted and you're overseeing a household and you are overseeing a business, and you are overseeing a city, and you are overseeing a state, when you in having the Spirit of God, and then you govern uh, that sphere, whether everyone's converted or not, those Christians who have the Spirit of God, they then conduct their lives and oversee the lives of others in light of the goodness of God's standard. So there are Holy Spirit converted people. Hence, the reason why these standards are being imposed. Okay? So, for example, like if, if I was a indwelt Spirit of God Christian, which I am, and I had a business. So, listen, you are not going to work on Sunday. I have the Spirit of God, and I am under God's law, and I have a jurisdiction here that I am supposed to oversee in light of the Lordship of Christ. OK, and you don't have to go to church on Sunday. Right. But in this jurisdiction, in this sphere, the first table is something that you will abide by so far as I am able to govern this sphere over. Um, yeah, the, I'm a conversionist and so am I. So, so is every Presbyterian. But nonetheless, there are converted people that are under the Lordship of Christ that are then to govern themselves accordingly in their spheres are terms I've tried consistently to use. I think uh, our society, historically and uh, and in the present, say as a as a as a suggesting that it's absolutely responsibility of the church is the preaching of the word of God and uh, the uh, the obedience of Christ's people and all that Christ commanded, and that includes, you know, honoring marriage, honoring the family, raising our children, and the nurture and admonition of the Lord, obeying Christ in all things, from the Great Commission. Uh, to the entirety of the biblical commands given to us. So that's, that's the Christian responsibility. I think the Christian citizen responsibility out of love of God and love of neighbor and obedience to Christ is to seek to influence the society in the most honorable and, uh, and truth-centered and God-honoring way to the limits of what is politically possible in any generation and to seek to make it even more possible in generations to come. 
So I am suggesting that it's absolutely right for Christian citizens to seek to bring about as much Christian influence in the society as is possible. And to see that reflected in public policy. In particular, you, we raise the abortion issue. I believe that it is. So here's where, where Mulder starts to contradict himself. So if I were to use your argument, Christians who have the spirit of God should do whatever they can to impose their worldview on public policy. And if I were to take your logic, I would say, well, public policy doesn't save people. Someone having to abide by a, a policy imposed and influenced by a Christian uh, isn't worship. They're not converted. Uh, it's, they're not saved because they conform to that standard. And, and Mo would be like, who cares? Who cares? Doesn't matter. It's still good for you. It's still good. For everyone, for that Christian standard to be imposed, right? You may not be Sabbathing in Christ. You may not be using his name doxologically to honor him, but you, you're not going to uh, take an oath in public, you know, to, to some kind of job or office in the name of Allah, okay? Uh, this, I'm a Christian. I have the Spirit of God, and I am going to seek to have my God and my worldview to be that which is the standard around. And whether you're, it doesn't convert you or not, it's still good and still necessary. So he's like, I'm a conversionist. And then he begins to talk in a way which shows that conversion uh, and conversion doesn't, conversion or lack of conversion doesn't negate the fact that Christianity um, is to be regulating life in public. Christian responsibility to seek to influence government so that government honors the fact that God is the author of life and that the human life is sacred and uh, the human life from the moment of fertilization until natural death is to be protected as a central priority. Christian influence in the society that then eventually laws would be put in place where they would acknowledge the state, the nation would acknowledge uh, not only uh, who God is type of thing in terms of a general confession of that, as well as then the application of moral law to marriage, family, um, sanctity of life, and so on. That would be the means by which we would we would do this. Yeah, without apology. I, I mean, this isn't some kind of covert strategy. I, I, th I think this is Christian citizenship. And we do acknowledge that our main means of bringing this about is the preaching of the word of God. And, and by the way, of course, that means to Christ people in order that they be conformed to the image of Christ. But actually, we also are to preach the word to the larger world because of the restraining power uh, of the word of God, even in restraining evil and evil doing. And, and, uh, and love this again, you're, you're, you're speaking like me, Moeller. <sighs> you're speaking like me as you keep talking like the, like, like the Presby. So, Look, the, the word of God, the word of God, it, it very, very, very much is to the whole counsel of God is to speak to the church, right? Conversion and edification, right? It, it is the, the word of God in the scriptures is very much a ecclesiologically focused word. But he doesn't stop there. He says, we preach the whole counsel of the whole word of God to the whole world. See, Moeller, unlike, you know, these uh, pietistic, you know, uh, evangelical dualistic types, he's not making a case for an ecclesiasticized Bible. Though he understands that the Bible is very much an ecclesiastical focused book. I mean, these letters are to the church. But he says, this book is a book that we as Christians speak to not just the whole church, but we speak to the whole world. And it has a restraining. The whole counsel of God outside of the church has a restraining power. And again, I, I, one of the reasons why I talk about the, the whole counsel of God outside of the ecclesiological sphere is not because I'm seeking to always be about the sole purpose of conversion. I understand that the whole counsel of God 
outside of the church, though it can bring people to saving faith, it also has a restraining power. And here's the reality. The word of God in a in the civil use has a restraining power so that the converting element of the word of God could take place, right? So when people are being restrained by the word of God externally, right? The Ten Commandments are being ex- externally enforced and imposed. It is restraining. That whole counsel about the whole world is restraining, and that allows the converting word of God as it restrains unrighteousness to then do its work. This is a great point. Great point. And affecting the conscience. You know, I think the Puritans were absolutely right about this and the, the historic Protestants in terms of this understanding. Uh, but there are also other means. There, there are proximate means and there are temporal means. As you say, electing candidates, you know, participating in the political process and, and doing so as Christians. I'm not looking for a confessional state. Uh, in the sense of, uh, say, you know, what you had in the German states in the 16th century. I am looking for a state that acknowledges that uh, the entire civilizational project of which it is a part is in, inseparable from Christianity and the basic moral, even metaphysical claims that are presented, ontological claims made by Christianity. And it can only be sustained that way. And I'll make that argument publicly as long as I have breath. If we- yeah, and so he so he says, yeah, I'm I'm all for this Christianity in public life, the Christian worldview, this this partiality of Christianity, which is great. I'm glad that Mo, uh, Mola the Baptist is all for being partial to Christianity, even though the June and the Presbyterian is scared to death of Christianity being prioritized in any way. Uh, but he says that I'm not. I'm all for the the Protestant. <laughs> The Protestant worldview imposed in American public life, I'm all for that, but I'm not for the confessional, the confessionalization of, of, of a nation or a state. What well, is the problem with that? Because the Protestant worldview is confessional. Covenantal confessional is the Protestant worldview. And so this is the, 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 the issue. I One of the, the shortfalls of the Baptists is, you know, they, they want to take certain things of protestantism right like certain doctrines and teachings but they want to unhinge it from covenantal confessional but here's the thing the 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 protestant worldview is confessional covenantal you can't unhinge that Uh, and for example like the fact that things in all spheres are under lordship of christ and the fact that people are representationally attached to collective groups like that that's that covenantal worldview the, the fact that that we're not a bunch of isolated peoples right but that there is a external standard that governs a majority right like all those things are, are come from the the protestant worldview so so Mueller's making a case for the christian worldview but tr- from protestantism but trying to unhinge it from the the worldview that is confessional covenantal. You can't do that. Um, and, and we've seen us try to do that. We've seen us try to be the uh, non-establishmentarian, non-covenantal Protestants. Um, and here we are. Here we are. Um, it's not going to work. If we were ever to get to that point, which would be a wonderful situation, we seem far, far from it, right? And and here's where in you know, the newspapers, gubernatorial election. Uh, look what's happening in in California and some other states. Now, this is not to say you can predict everything. Just just speaking in terms. What what's the the location with that kind of preaching? So I think about Sunday by Sunday, the people of God gather where they hear the word of God. Is there some sense that those places are preaching to the broader world, or is there some place else? And then two, is there a place for Scripture to be used actually to make the arguments for um, various legislations that are coming forward, or? Is it something where this should be something more of natural law, or is it both and uh, that we should not shy away from allowing the testament of Scripture to speak to those things, even as we make arguments from creation order as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll simply say, first of all, the way you set that up rhetorically means, yes, of course, it's both and. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, I say that obviously in a friendly way because you, you set it up mm-hmm. very well. Uh, and and so, yeah, I think it is both and. I think we have to have the positive preaching of the word of God, but we also have to learn how to make arguments. And and I think Calvin's a good illustration of this. It, 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 and learn how to make arguments based upon the uh, the cognitive content of the Imago Dei and uh, and the, the cognitive and moral content of creation order. And th- Here we go. Again, the Baptist is understanding something consistent uh, with the Reformed Covenantal way of seeing the world. So the question is, we, we, we've heard this many times around us, and uh, even you've heard me discuss this. Like, is the standard for a, a, a people, is it revealed law or natural law, right? And you got some that are saying that the word of God is the standard for everything. So no natural law anywhere. There, there'd be some like a over-pronounced Vantillian, you know, theonomist, right? It's like that the word of God is an RPW for not just the church, but for like everything in public life. Uh, and then you'll have those that will believe that natural law governs not only the world, but the, the church is governed by uh, innate intuition. That's some of the progressive types. And then, and then you have the, the dualistic types that will say, well, Scripture is, governs the church, and nature and natural revelation govern society. And then the Reformed would say, and he gives Calvin as a great example, the Word of God and natural revelation govern both the church, by the way, uh, there, there are things that our confession, particularly in chapter one, says are understood by nature, right? Circumstantial things, um, uh, even just like our Robert's rules, right? Um, but natural and supernatural, revealed uh, and uh, revealed, revealed law, and also you know written on the heart law, both of those are the standards for a society, right? So you have natural law apart from the more clear revealed law, and and you will have this vague, vague, uh, somewhat less than actual law clear law in society. You you, you have uh, revealed law with no natural arguments. You you will have uh, this biblicism, right, that that over-pronounces, over-pronounces regeneration and under- pronounces the Imago Dei on, on, on every image bearer. So yeah, the scriptures and natural revelation are that which in, it imposes uh, its standard on a society. That's the reform view. Um, the the uh, natural law for the world, revealed law for the church, it, it is something that literally no reform person in history would make a case for this is modern nonsense i think those things are just vitally important and right now you know we need all the creation order uh messaging that we can give and so you know i, I would say of course it has to be both and but you know it's really interesting the way you 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 mentioned just the uh, the, the the public role of the church or questioning the public role of the church uh, and you said, where does that take place? Which I thought was funny. I said, well, I just stood in one of the places that took place, and that's St. George's Chapel at Windsor, where John Knox, you know, uh, pointedly addressed Edward VI, the reforming boy king, about priests genuflecting to the altar. And so, I mean, the, this is not new. It's it, it, it's Paul before, you know, Felix. It's John Knox before Edward VI. That's uh, John Knox before Mary. Again, uh, Muller says, look, this, this idea that, that, that the people in the church, we speak the word of God uh, to society, about society, it's nothing new. Knox, Paul, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is very different than a lot of the people in my Presbyterian universe who are, well, when do you ever see, you know, the Reformed or, or, or the Apostle Paul, you know, speak to people in civil power about, the, you know, the, the, the Christian worldview and, and how they govern and um, and actually, Paul does say things about how magic is governed. He says to him, hey, if I have violated the first table of the law, you can kill me. Um, so, yeah, our tradition um, is very much, and this is what Mo is acknowledged, our tradition 
is men that speak the word of God authoritatively to the church and speak the word of God authoritatively to the man outside the church in the various spheres of reality. Queen of Scots. And it's colonial pastors and their remonstrances in the, what became the United States. It's Christian activity, which, by the way, should never be covert. In other words, we have the right and responsibility as Christian citizens to show up making these arguments. And, you know, I, I don't think there should be any hesitation in doing so. So I asked the question in part because I think there probably has been some measure of hesitation because I think there's been a fear of those who should only be preaching to make disciples should only be focusing on those things of the spirituality of the church, that there is probably an overemphasis on taking care of those things and leaving politics to the side. But I think what you have said and what we would want to say as well is, no, actually there's a role for the pastor to preach to the local congregation and beyond, equipping those disciples to take that message into the culture, wherever their vocation leads them. And it seems as though that's been weak in some corners uh, or even more spiritual to say, just focus on the life of the church and don't dirty yourself with the politics in the pulpit or anything to that effect. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, it's fair. And there's a massive theological problem. So yes. for one thing, you have the Southern Presbyterian, you know, spirituality of the church argument. That didn't, that doesn't look too good in retrospect. And then you have the kind of Stanley Hauerwas sectarian argument, which a lot of kind of more, um, I'll just say, evangelicals who do not want to have to speak hard truths to the culture. You say, well, okay, we'll speak those hard truths. Yeah, yeah. Good point, Moeller. A lot of these guys, the reason why they're theologizing the way they do is they're justifying their apathy and their fear of people. So I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be in the in the the heat of controversy. So let me theologize my absolute abstinence from all these things um, that I don't want to talk about. Yes, 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 yes. In the church, and we'll just pull out. And w w the the problem with that is that the the whole counsel of God includes most importantly special revelation in the form of scripture. But it also includes creation order and data, knowledge, and truth to which every single human being in every place, regardless of whether or not they've ever heard uh, the gospel, are obligated. But it's not just that they're obligated. We actually believe this is the way that leads to human flourishing. Oh, dude. <laughs> every human being is obligated and they flourish. Right? So, Noller is, again, he's... he's He's kind of like a little bit contradicting himself and, and speaking my language. So the, the word of God begins in creation. The Ten Commandments begin in creation. That's, you know, Westminster uh, chapter 19, 1 and 2. This law continues to be the standard through Moses and beyond. So the law of God, because it's creational, not new creational. The, the law of God is both creational and new creational. It, it, it obliges and has consequences for everybody. And this is the, the major issue, I believe, with the whole Christ and culture, is, is there is this lack of understanding that God's rule and reign is both creational and new creational. God's standards are both creational and new creational. And when we have many people that have the, there, there's this standard, there's these standards for the new creation. And then there's these other standards or non-standards for the creation. But, but Moeller saying, look, God is the creator God. And therefore, his creational will obliges you. And he's going to say that, by the way, men who are unsaved acknowledging God's creational order is good for them, even if they hate Christ. And I will say, yes, Moeller, now keep adding to that. Men who hate Christ who don't work on the Sabbath, men who hate Christ, you know, who don't promote Baal in public, right? Who, who don't desecrate society <laughs> and use their platforms to promote uh, idols and blaspheme. Them not doing that is actually something that is good for them, even though they're not safe. Creation obliges all. God's mandates and standards are over his creation and also over his new creation. We actually believe that regardless of regeneration, it still honors God 
that an unbelieving man would be faithful to his. Regardless of regeneration, he says it honors God. So he's saying that there's something beneficial. Now he's going to adultery and marriage. But why wouldn't you go everywhere? You know? Why wouldn't you go everywhere? That's the pot. That, that's that's the that's that uh that that Baptist compartmentalizing, congregationalizing, isolating, isolating. You know, um, that's coming out there. But I, I'm like, I'm like, come on, think about that. Why not test that out in other places, right? His wife and would protect his family and would be industrious. Was it good for Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, to in his office? Make a principle of the second commandment. You just said it's good for that pagan who doesn't love God to do something about the commandments or externally when it comes to his marriage. Why would you not see that goodness also with Darius and Nebuchadnezzar? Think about it. Yes, rather than uh, lazy and uh, and would feed his children and, and contribute to the society. This is creation order. And so. The, the problem with a lot of this modern sectarianism is that it's it's just a way of copping out from the responsibility of, of the church's public witness. And by the way, it won't work, you know, because honestly, over time, the aggressively secular, ideologically driven left is not going to be any more satisfied for you to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord than you for try to try to arrange the uh, laws of Orange County, California, according to. Yeah. So he's saying it's basically it's Christ or chaos, inevitably. So to, to, to the Christians, like, oh, you know what? I don't want Christianity in public life. You know, I actually have this whole ridiculous theology, which <laughs> sucks the glory of God and his oughtness uh, imperatively out of society. But I'm just going to, like, be Christian with my kids. <laughs> and moments like, it don't work that way. <laughs> um, you either have standards that are allowing everybody their appropriate space and limiting people creationally, or you will have autonomy, autonomy which deifies humans and then will absorb and swallow up everything. It's not going to work that way. Uh, Christian conviction. They want our children. You know, they're they're not going to be satisfied to have subversives preaching the Bible in a sectarian sense. You know, I could I could hear someone, you know, here listening to this and and a Christian saying. Yeah. So so when you got like a Scott Scott Clark kind of person say, oh, just leave us alone, just leave us alone and, and we'll be fine. That's not the way that's not the way the world works. That's not the way Babylon works. That's not the way anthropology is. There is no end to unrestrained autonomy. Until everything is constrained unto that ultimacy, which is false. Boy, this is going to involve a lot of my time. I mean, how, how do I, you know, be a Christian influence in the society? How do I get involved in government? Any recommendations? I mean, I would think that we would want to say, look, you start in the sphere that you're placed. Uh, start, first of all, be faithful as a, you know, a father, a mother, uh, raising children, doing that properly, having a solid marriage, you get out and vote. If your children are in a public school system, be involved in that system type of thing. Is that what you would say? Is just start where you are because you're a finite person. You can't do everything, can you? Evidently not. I mean, Steve, very good point. And this is where I'd say, look, there's a there's a basic Christian worldview principle that Protestants haven't had to think much about. When, um, when the worldview of the larger society was pretty much congenial to us, you didn't have to think about some of the patterns of Christian thinking that I think are clearly biblical. And one of them is, is, uh, has been more commonly discussed by Catholics than Protestants and that subsidiarity. And, uh, and I, I think it's clearly true. It's, it's in creation order, the most basic meaning and the best union of the goods is in the most basic unit of society, which is why society is not good at raising children. You need. This is great. Cause so a lot of times when we talk about a, a Christian nation, Christian nationalism, a lot, a lot of the pushback is like, oh, you guys believe in some kind of top-down, politicized Christianity. It's like, no, no, we don't. Uh, we didn't say that. You're just making us look bad because you can't deal with our arguments. 
Um, and so you want to like throw these straw mans up there that make us look like clowns. But, but Christian nationalism in a biblical confessional sense is about those lower spheres uh, being subject to Christ's lordship and then moving out. That's how it, that's, that's, that's reformation, right? It's reforming of the individual, the reforming of marriage, the reforming of, of the home, reforming of, of the church, reforming of the church membership, right? And these, these, uh, local, local, like places of worship, doxology and discipleship. And then that bleeds out. That's always been the way of reformation, right? And he's basically articulating like like the way you you want you want to reform a society. Church government got it. Obviously, he wouldn't agree with me, but church government re reform the pulpit, reform the office, right? Uh, cat, you know you got you got to have a standard for the church, right? You you got to have a a a a holiness and piety for the home, and and, and then we begin to to see that work its way out. Uh, into the broader life. Absolutely. Mom and dad to raise children. You need marriage. You need family. So the more basic you get, but, but Christians also need to be in the halls. We think of Aaron Ren or this earthly. So that's where Christians should start. We should, you know, subsidiarity is also seats of judges and uh, Christians need to be uh, working. And, and here's the thing. It's and I, I was trying to fast forward. Basically says Christians need to be judges. Christians need to be this. Yes, yes. One of the things that I find troubling about a lot of uh, people in this conversation is it they talk about Christians as if we're irrelevant to social, political, public life. Like when we're in social, political, public life, our, our Christianity is irrelevant. All that matters in our social, political, public life is that we're image bearers, right? So you're an image bearer and I'm an image bearer. That's all that matters in this public space. But what, what Moeller is saying is that the regenerate person, being regenerate, is particularly necessary for all of life. We are not the salt of the church. We are not the light of the church. We, we are salt and light to the world, and that has a multiplicity of implications. It's not just, uh, you, you see your need for conversion through my, uh, my adorning the gospel of my life. Um, it is it is it is comprehensive. Christianity is needed. If Christianity was not needed, then God would not be converting the masses in the globe. He wouldn't be doing that. If we weren't needed, then we would just be converted and zapped out and, and taken out. But he he converts us. He leaves us here and he calls us in all these places of life. Right. Uh, to to be Christians. We are necessary. So liberating because everything governmental. Hence, First Timothy two. Pray that there would be spirit and dwell people in the magisterial sphere. First Timothy two. Political for Christians is proximate and not everlasting. In other words, we're not called to be politically active and an educator. What does theological education for those training for ministry look like in the negative world? Uh, understand where they are in the flow of uh, the history of the church and, and, and the history of the world, uh, history of God's purposes and the unfolding purpose of God in order that uh, they may be faithful in this generation and perpetuate the faith once we're all delivered to the saints uh, in the generation to come. Uh, speaking of something that's pragmatic, I'm talking to you guys today as an extension of the methodology I have about how to deal with these issues, and that is be loud. <laughs> So uh, I think a part of what we have to do is in front, I mean, we just you know, had a forum panel discussion in chapel this morning here. By, by the way, Pat another place of agreement, Christians, you should be loud. You know, I've seen, I seen people use uh, Second Thessalonians, you know, be quiet, mind your own business as, as some kind of comprehensive statement for the Christians uh, conversational public life. Now, what is going on there is something very particular. There wasn't Christians using uh, their places and spaces to to uh, to make a case for the lordship of Christ 
uh, whether it's a gospel thing or a law thing. That that's not what being it. These are these are people that were being twisted by bad eschatology and running around uh, in some frenzy because the Lord the, the Lord was something about the Lord's coming being being confused and um, and they were being problematic to other Christians. So this is this. That's not some statement about how Christians uh, use their their voice in the places they are to be very, very, very bold about what they're about, right? So, so Moeller is basically, you know, again in line with with the the Reformed tradition, right? That we should be the loudest people in school boards. In, in political sphere and in, in, in educational institutions, we should be the loudest people because we have the mind of Christ. We have the words of Christ, right? We have the spirit of God. We have been commissioned by the one who has all authority over every authority, right? The king of kings, the Lord of lords over all lords. And we are his people. We are his, his ambassadors to speak not simply just about coming to Christ for conversion. We are ambassadors who speak the whole counsel of God to the whole of the world. So, so we should be loud. We should be loud. We should not be uh, these pitter-patter, uh, wimpy, quiet uh, people. We should be loud. When you see woke people and leftists very much vocal, about their passions. It should be a rebuke to you. Rebuke to you, Christian, uh, with your great passivity and lack of emphasis, right, about the Lord's will and ways uh, in public life. Act out. He's talking about, the, you know, Israel and the, the current situation, Hamas. Yeah, I think we have, you know, there's it would not. I know if you go back to the Augustinian tradition, which would include Calvin, Luther, uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, as you just look through, you know, I, I actually think the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin is very important here. I think I think his understanding of the duplex cognito dei and is I uh, just real quick comment here. So he said, "Oh, I'm Augustinian. I love Augustine," <laughs> and he's saying, in, as it comes to like his worldview and political philosophy, well, you know, the, the reform in, in the in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, they, they look at Augustine as Someone who was very much paradigmatic for for their view of church and state, right? So, like you know, they said Donatists, the Donatists were were heretics. That Augustine very much believed that the state, the state should do something about punishing uh, those who are heretical, and the reformers would see that as a paradigm. So, uh, Moeller, uh, you are Augustinian, and then you go to Calvin, um, and and Augustine and Calvin would very much believe that uh, false religion, false Christianity um, should not be tolerated by the magistrate. You know, they're, they're, the freedom and liberty of conscience does not involve the freedom to, to speak and spread things that send people to hell and provoke God's temporal judgments now and later. That, that, so if you're Augustinian, if you're, if, you're, if you're Calvinistic and you're making a case for public life in Christianity, um, you, you, you're going to have to uh, get over that skittishness, that Baptist skittishness over the magistrate enforcing first table things externally. And of even the law. That's not to say we're trying to recreate Geneva. It's just saying, you know, Calvin actually thought these things through. And uh, what Calvin isolates as impossible is the idea that Christianity doesn't have cultural influence simply because of the uh, the glory of God in creation. As someone described what I call creation order, it's the knowledge you cannot not know. Yeah. So you think about the Reformation, Calvin, Samuel Rutherford, Lex Rex would That's be right. another one that That's would right. be incredibly important at that point. Yeah, I was introduced to that by Francis Schaeffer, by the way, when I was a teenager, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm ordering Lex Rex from B. Dalton <laughs> as, a, as a 16, 17 year old. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what about the Baptist tradition? So often there's been, I think, Baptists are, you know, the separation of church and state, maybe too much of a separation. You've been certainly talking about being out loud with the impact that Christians can have. We're conversionists. We certainly don't believe that the state is the means by which the kingdom is going to go forward. It is through the preaching of the gospel. But see, this is, this is what I'm trying to help clarify the air. 
we're Baptists, which means we're conversionists, which means we don't believe that the kingdom of God goes forward by the state. No. Now, if you're talking about if you're talking about Erastians and in and, and the in and the, and the Church of England tradition, if you're talking about integralists with those who have like they're coming from Rome, okay, I, I understand that statement, but we don't believe that the kingdom of God goes forward uh, by the by this Christian prince being the spearhead catalyst. Like, who are you talking about? We believe that, and I say we believe. I'm, I'm talking about the Scottish Reformed tradition. Um, that the magistrate is a nursing father to the work of the church, right? He uh, he can support the work of the church, but but he does not. He's not the catalyst that drives the work of the church forward. The work, the kingdom of God, is spearheaded by the church and the means of grace, and, and the magistrate can can be uh, a deacon and nursing father uh, to support. So we don't believe that Christianity goes forward by magisterial power, but we also, contra Baptist and pietistic reform people, we don't believe that the magistrate plays no role in the support of religion. The way we would say, you know, the church is, 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 uh, operates in matters of religion and, and the state about matters of religion. Some of the early Baptists had a great influence on the culture, on the laws of the land. Are there particular ones? I think about John Leland, but are there others or other books that you would recommend pastors read today, especially from the Baptist tradition? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize where Baptists come from. We didn't appear at the First Baptist Church of Dallas of George W. Truett in the 20th century. And so as you follow this, you look at nonconformity in England, and, and you look in particular, say, at the Westminster Confession. And, you know, the Westminster Confession is, is exactly the foundation of, uh, of the, the worldview that became even the abstract of principles of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. So, I mean, we're, we're in the same family there. And the Westminster Confession by no means allows some total separation as if they're two different realms. There's a realm in which Christian truth is applicable to a realm in which Christian truth is not. Yes, which is why they believe that the matter should is to punish blasphemy, uh, which is why they believe that magistrates tolerating false religion is wrong, which is why the entire Westminster Standards is grounded and in the the rooting of a national covenant, right, and a national confession. Um, I, I would I would really be curious to to hear him say more as to how Southern Seminary is grounded in the Westminster standards and the worldview. You know, um, that's 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 a stretch there. That, that's that's a hard one. It's a hard one. I gotta admit, I'm not convinced. <laughs> you really don't have that until you have Baptists making the case. Uh, in the face of persecution or marginalization, that there should not be a state church. And and I believe there should not be a state church. I'll go on the record there. I don't want a confessional state to the extent that the state has a position on sacraments uh, or ordinances. That I, I do not want that. I want the state to define the gospel. I want it to acknowledge the Christian truth claims that make this civilization possible, honor them, and allow the perpetuation of them in churches. I don't want the, the state to organize a church. But that separationism in the 20th century led many Baptists to think it's a separation of Christ and society. And that is not. And by the way, this is this, this is good. Um, so he's acknowledging that one of the issues why, why, why Baptists become hyper. Hyper polarizing with the whole church and state thing and religion is because they have a martyr complex. I'm really glad to hear a Baptist say that, but also it's funny because Presbyterians do this too. One of the things that Presbyterians who have this not reformed view of church and state uh, is they, they bring up the, the, the capital punishment of Baptists. And so like the Presbyterians bring up the martyr objections of, of non Presbyterian Baptists. And, you know, more was like, Hey man, like stuff happens. Stuff happens, uh, it, it, but it, it doesn't take away from the legitimacy of of everything that we're talking about. 
Well, one other thing that, that I would like to uh, bring up here that uh, is, 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 is significant, the state shouldn't have a position on sacraments. Why not? If the state has a position on heroin, right? The, uh, by, by the way, where do they get that? Obviously, the other people in society, they are able to tell us, you know, what substances do. And, and you know, you learn. It's not like you have, oh, you have a heroin guy, you know, working in Miami-Dade. Uh, but they consult with other people uh, that have a a professional credibility, right? So. The, the state has a position on heroin. Heroin's legal. Why? Because heroin kills people. So why why can't the state have a position on sacraments that doesn't come from them, right? I mean, you could just look at Parliament. Hey, why don't you guys let us know? Define sacraments for us so we know what is dangerous and, and what should be uh, uh, regulated. You know, define church government. Tell us. Sit over here, we'll, we'll watch you guys do your thing. So it, it, if the state can have a position on heroin, why couldn't it, through consulting the confessional church, have a position on sacraments? Because when you, let's put it this way, when you sell heroin, it kills people. When you blaspheme Christ with something like the Catholic Mass, and you turn Jesus Christ into bread and re-sacrifice him. That kills people when you sell that on the corner. It brings God's temporal judgments. And it brings eschatological consummate judgments. So, of course, the state should have a position on selling heroin. If people are selling a lie about God turning into bread and provoking him with gross harlotry. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Uh, sacraments being publicly served that way is way more harmful than someone shooting heroin. Straight up. It's always anecdotal, right? So in other words, they don't believe that when it comes to alleviating poverty. You know, they'll be glad to use Christian moral language about the programs they want. But when it comes, and this is where, you know, so, some thinkers in the early 20th century, they said, okay, this is what's coming. The revolt is going to come on, well, what one later politician called the pelvic issues. It's going to come on sex and marriage. Do we need as Christians and as churches to form some larger organization to galvanize Christians to be involved. I mean, it, it's not going to just happen, you know, by itself, or there has to be in some sense, um, some kind of, you know, way means by which we can say, all right, let's, let's work together. Let's strategize. Let's plan. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I think you're, you're right. I think it's a means it, the, the, these organizations are proximate means. And the problem is in a fallen world, they're all organizations that have kind of a limited shelf life. Jesus said about the church, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The organizations that are not the church and yet may involve many Christians, a lot of them just have a shelf life, but they're important. They're really important. And, and so I've been on the boards of some of these organizations and I believe in them. This is a great point. So I remember one time, uh, I, I've read a lot. Okay, so I don't remember everything. But I remember one time, I was reading some of Keller's stuff, and, and the way he was talking about the church organization was almost like the kingdom of God is working through all these entities, and the church is just one of them. And so it was almost like he was flattening out like Christian entities of all kinds, and the church is being one of many things that, that the king and 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 then you got like the the ecclesiastical monopoly that that you know the god's institution is the church and therefore like any christianization christianization of other institutions is entirely irrelevant uh in the whole conversation about christ's kingdom and so man this is a really he's saying look the apex institution of jesus christ is a church that is the only eschatological institution but the Christianization of other organizations is important. It's very important, right? So seminaries are not the apex 
ecclesiological kingdom, right? They're not. Um, you know, the, the, the hospitals, right, that, that Christians historically made, the universities, you know, th th those are not the church. But Christians making those institutions were certainly things that were useful um, to the kingdom of God, though it wouldn't be the apex of the kingdom, right? Um, so there is a distinction between the the church and other Christianized entities, right? It's funny, like I don't believe in I don't believe in a Christian state. I don't believe in a Christian organization. What do you call a seminary? What do you call a family? <laughs> what are you talking about? You can see something as Christian that's not the church. If there's Christians there, right? Uh, going going in light of the covenantal representational worldview, where you don't just see everything in light of every single person, but there is, you know, representational figures, uh, right? Uh, so when the kings would would covenant uh, with with Israel, then then that whole nation would be affected covenantally by that covenant. Anyway, I don't want to ever confuse them with the church, but yeah, I think this is you know educational mobilization. This is cool in the architectural. It was called pillarism. So you had these columns that you had. And so that Dr. Mueller is part of, of moving forward together as those questions continue to be at the forefront. Yeah, I think some of this is based upon, you know, kind of hypothetical thoughts and imaginations, very much untied to reality. So I, I'd <laughs> rather spend my time more talking about reality. And, and so, you know, if, if you are talking about the professions, you can't just decide, okay, in our society, and we do, but it's a different day today than it was then. And I think there's some who are wanting to kind of even question, can we go back to American founding? Some are saying that we are post-constitutional. We need to go back to the magisterial reformers to be able to learn from them and to have a Christian prince or are open to some things that are not kind of traditionally American. And I wonder if that's where some of the debate lies. And if you see that, and if so, if you have any just kind of counsel to think through why that's the division or even some fruitful ways of moving forward together as those questions continue to be at the forefront. Yeah, I think some of this is based upon, you know, kind of hypothetical thoughts and imaginations, very much untied to reality. So I, I'd rather <laughs> spend my time more talking about reality. And, and so, you know, if, if you are talking about the professions, you can't just decide, okay, in our society, I'm going to call this person a doctor. You know, we are in a regulated administrative context. I mean, even the people who are saying that don't believe it enough to do it. And so nonetheless, that doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to contend for the right regulations and the right administrators who are deciding these things, the right body of law and policy and and all the rest. But, you know, the, the further, this is, again, I think deeply Christian, rooted in creation order and validated in scripture. The further we abstract from the most basic unit, the harder it is for Christian influence to be legitimate and substantial. So our greatest opportunity for Christian influence is with our children and with our grandchildren and our families. And then, of course, in our churches. And, and then in the extension of those churches, like I I, I'm committed to the fact that this seminary and college, the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and Boyce College, reflect the convictions of our churches and that those convictions, you know, be deeply biblical and, yes, proudly countercultural. But again, I often when I'm talking in public about this, I use the airport. You know, I, I, I just don't ever expect to land in a Christian airport. I do want competent air traffic controllers and, and competent pilots. I don't think that's separated from the Christian worldview. I just want to say those who are trying to say we can have a parallel universe— you're still flying on their planes to go to your conference to make that argument. I think when it comes to some political structures, there's an urgency reflected in the panic. At, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not just panic, the urgency on the part of many Christians saying, you know, how, how can we do this? If, if we're in a society that's going to vote this way. Yeah, so he says something here about how far are we going to go with the Christian? So Christianization of institutions is, is a good thing, right? That things outside the church should be Christianized. They can be Christianized. Uh, now there needs to be qualification. What does it mean to be Christianized? Like, is, is are we gonna are we gonna ecclesiasticize like the whole world? You know, no. Um, there there needs to be uh, explanation as to what that looks like, what that means. But um, it, it says that 
you know, we, we don't need a Christian airport. And um, this is, I know what, I know what Mueller is saying, but this is a dangerous way to go because this is what, this is what the, uh, the, the uh, quasi Gnostic dualistic, you know, afterlife, uh, heavy guys will say, well, what, what, what is a, you know, Christian Palmer? And the reality is, is that though I, I'm not making a case for some kind of, you know, Reformation Airlines, okay? <laughs> but there is the reality that in a godly society, there can be a Christianized airport. What do I mean by that? Well, in a Christian worldview, men govern uh, all spaces. They they lead. So the people that you know are in charge in the airport and overseeing it sh should be men, right? In light of the, the, the Christian worldview, um, the Sabbath is a holy day for all creation, whether you're saved or not. So airports uh, should be closed on those days uh, unless there is some work of necessity or mercy that would be provided for uh by an airport right they have uh some you know a lot of airports they have some kind of chaplain there you shouldn't have some you know uh heretical or you know christian heresy or some kind of false religion uh person there uh the kind of things that you're selling the kind of things you're advertising uh should not be you know contradicting the the second table of the law so i understand that statement but when you think about it christianity can genuinely inform any institution in some way right uh and, and I, i'm just doing this just quickly off the fly but you get my point uh hey let's put it this way um there's a reason why you don't want to go to airports uh in muslim countries and you 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 feel relieved uh, or even in catholic heavy countries when when, when, you, when you come to a, a airport in a more christianized country the airport is different why is that because of what he said earlier the the, the tertiary and uh, effects of christianity anyway then then what are we going to do and you know that's where the christian options are fewer than people would like to think we're still left with persuasion and political organization and influence it's uh, it's not like we can call interpol to solve this problem for us that's good yeah one of the things i've been reflecting on is the fact that for all the calls to make the nation christian there's a need to make the church christian right i mean if the church is what christ has promised to to build we see many churches that are deeply unhealthy that had, do not have a sufficient trust in the word of god the sufficiency of scripture is not there the doctrines of scripture are not rightly proclaimed there and if in fact the church actually held to those things and i know that's what southern seminar has done and other institutions as well but if the churches do that then that will have an impact on individuals who go into the culture. And that continues to be our hope. If there's going to be a Christian culture with the worldview that is impacted, it begins with the preaching of the gospel, the change in the churches that then seeps out from there. Great way to conclude. Great way to end. Yeah, we need, we need to, you know, these people like make America great again. Um, <laughs> make the church Presbyterian again. Maybe Mueller wouldn't agree with that sentiment. Uh, make the church reformed again. So I, I do believe that the issues out there are really come down to, you know, the, the churches. I, I, and this is where, you know, the uh, separatists of church and state that are ex extremely pronounced will, will push back. But I do believe that uh, the state of society goes hand in hand uh, with uh, the state of the church. Now you say, oh, what about, you know, these places in the Middle East and China where there's all these Christians? I mean, Christianity is new. Um, just think about, like, all the Christians that were being, you know, regenerated uh, in the first century, Rome. Well, it took like three or, four, three or four centuries for that to really see its effects. So, but all that to say is that Christianity and the way churches worship, and an honor of the Lord 
it, it does affect society. And so all these Christians that are hyper sensitive to cultural uh, chaos, uh, they need to look to their homes, right? I mean, you know, someone made a point that I disagree with somewhat, but agree with somewhat. Like, you, know, you guys are all jacked up about some Satan statue uh, in, a, in a public institution. And you guys are all blaspheming Christ with images of Christ and all your, you know, your crosses and paraphernalia and paper, popery. You know, like you, the Christians really need to look, take a look at like their worship services, their churches and all their monuments, of idolatry, you know, your, your pagan lens, all that stuff. Like you, you need to really uh, take a look at your, you know, passivity in the home and lack of just piety in the church. Like that's where. This whole societal conversation really comes down to judgment beginning with the church of God, you know, and so very good, very good. Like, what's the call? What, what is where, where do we go uh, with this? And, and it, it is with that ecclesiological, familial, local church, uh, grassroots fear becoming reformed and, and revived. So. I, I found uh, a lot of commonality with uh, with Moeller's take on Christian nationalism. Obviously, I, I push back. And um, anyways, good stuff. Good stuff. And um, hopefully, hopefully uh, having this next to the Drunen, uh, the Young, and also next to like the uh, Scott Clark uh, and Brad, all these three compared, will will it will it'll give you a good picture. Uh, of of the waters and 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 the map. Anyways, grace and peace. Signing off. Kingdom polemics.